Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, also known as the Ark of the Testimony, is a gold-covered wooden chest with lid cover described in the book of Exodus as containing two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. According to various texts within the Hebrew Bible, it also contained Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. Hebrews 9 4 describes, the Ark of the Covenant, was, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. The biblical account relates that, approximately one year after the Israelites' exodus from Egypt, the Ark was created according to the pattern given to Moses be God when the Israelites were encamped at the foot of biblical Mount Sinai. Thereafter, the gold-plated acacia chest was carried by its staves while en route be the Levites approximately 2,000 cubits, approximately, in advance of the people when on the march or before the Israelite army, the host of fighting men. When carried, the ark was always hidden under a large veil made of skins and blue cloth, always carefully concealed, even from the eyes of the priests and the Levites who carried it. God was said to have spoken with Moses from between the two cherubim on the ark's cover. When at rest the tabernacle was set up and the holy ark was placed in it under the veil of the covering, the staves of it crossing the middle side bars to hold it up off the ground. According to the book of Exodus, God instructed Moses on Mount Sinai during his 40 day stay upon the mountain within the thick cloud and darkness where God was and he was shown the pattern for the tabernacle and furnishings of the ark to be made of shittim wood to house the tablets of stone. Moses instructed Bezalel and Aholiab to construct the ark. In Deuteronomy, however, the ark is said to have been built specifically by Moses himself without reference of Bezalel or Aholiab. The book of Exodus gives detailed instructions on how the ark is to be constructed. It is to be two cubits in length, one in breadth, and one in height, approximately. Then it is to be gilded entirely with gold, and a crown or molding of gold is to be put around it. Four rings of gold are to be attached to its four corners, two on each side, and through these rings staves of shittim wood overlaid with gold for carrying the ark are to be inserted, and these are not to be removed. A golden lid, the caporet, traditionally mercy seat in Christian translations, which is covered with two golden cherubim is to be placed above the ark. Missing from the account are instructions concerning the thickness of the mercy seat and details about the cherubim other than that the cover be beaten out the ends of the ark and that they form the space where God will appear. The ark is finally to be placed under the veil of the covering. The biblical account continues that, after its creation by Moses, the ark was carried by the Israelites during their 40 years of wandering in the desert. Whenever the Israelites camped, the ark was placed in a separate room in a sacred tent, called the tabernacle. When the Israelites, led by Joshua toward the Promised Land, arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, the ark was carried in the lead preceding the people and was the signal for their advance. During the crossing, the river grew dry as soon as the feet of the priests carrying the ark touched its waters, and remained so until the priests, with the ark, left the river after the people had passed over. As memorials, twelve stones were taken from the Jordan Ath place where the priests had stood. In the Battle of Jericho, the ark was carried round the city once a day for seven days, preceded by the armed men and seven priests sounding seven trumpets off ram's horns. On the seventh day, the seven priests sounding the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark compassed the city seven times and, with a great shout, Jericho's wall fell down flat and the people took the city. After the defeat at Ai, Joshua lamented before the ark. When Joshua read the law to the people between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, they stood on each side of the ark. We next hear of the ark in Bethel where it was being cared for by the priest Phineas the grandson of Aaron, where Bethel is translated the house of God in the King James Version. According to this verse it was consulted by the people of Israel when they were planning to attack the Benjaminites at the Battle of Gibeah. Later, however, the ark was kept at Shiloh, another religious center some north of Bethel, at the time of the prophet Samuel's apprenticeship, where it was cared for by Hophni and Phineas. Two sons of Eli. A few years later, the elders of Israel decided to take the ark out onto the battlefield to assist them against the Philistines, after being defeated at the Battle of Ebenezer. They were, however, heavily defeated with the loss of 30,000 men. The ark was captured by the Philistines, and Hophni and Phinehas were killed. The news of its capture was at once taken to Shiloh by a messenger with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head. The old priest, Eli, fell dead when he heard it, and his daughter in law, Bearing a son at the time the news of the capture of the ark was received, named him Ichabod, explained as the glory has departed Israel in reference to the loss of the ark. The mother of the child Ichabod died at his birth. The Philistines took the ark to several places in their country, and at each place misfortune befell them. 
At Ashdod it was placed in the temple of Dagon. The next morning Dagon was found prostrate, bowed down, before it, and on being restored to his place, he was on the following morning again found prostrate and broken. The people of Ashdod were smitten with tumors, a plague of mice was sent over the land. The affliction of boils was also visited upon the people of Gath and of Ekron, whither the ark was successively removed. After the ark had been among them for seven months, the Philistines, on the advice of their diviners, returned it to the Israelites, accompanying its return with an offering consisting of golden images of the tumors and mice wherewith they had been afflicted. The ark was set up in the field of Joshua the Bethshemite, and the Bethshemites offered sacrifices and burnt offerings. Out of curiosity the men of Beth Shemesh gazed at the ark, and as a punishment, seventy of them, fifty thousand and seventy in some translations, were smitten by the Lord. The Beth Shemites sent to Kerjath Jerem, or Baal Judah, to have the ark removed, and it was taken to the house of Abinadab, whose son Eliezer was sanctified to keep it. Kerjath Jerem remained the abode of the ark for twenty years. Under Saul, the ark was with the army before he first met the Philistines, but the king was too impatient to consult it before engaging in battle. In 1 Chronicles 13 3, it is stated that the people were not accustomed to consulting the ark in the days of Saul. At the beginning of his reign over the united monarchy, King David removed the ark from Kerjath Jerim amid great rejoicing. On the way to Zion, Uzzah, one of the drivers of the cart that carried the ark, put out his hand to steady the ark and was struck dead by God for touching it. The place was subsequently named Perazuzah, literally outburst against Uzzah, as a result. David, in fear, carried the ark aside into the house of Obed-Edom Jatite, instead of carrying it on to Zion, and there it stayed three months. On hearing that God had blessed Obed-Edom because of the presence of the ark in his house, David had the ark brought to Zion by the Levites, while he himself, girded with a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might and in the sight of all the public gathered in Jerusalem, a performance tat caused him to be scornfully rebuked by his first wife, Saul's daughter Michal. In Zion, David put the ark in the tabernacle he had prepared for it, offered sacrifices, distributed food, and blessed the people in his own household. The Levites were appointed to minister before the ark. David's plan of building a temple for the ark was stopped at the advice of God. The ark was with the army during the siege of Rabbah, and when David fled from Jerusalem at the time of Absalom's conspiracy, the ark was carried along with him until he ordered Zadok the priest to return it to Jerusalem. When Abiathar was dismissed from the priesthood by King Solomon for having taken part in Adonijah's conspiracy against David, his life was spared because had formerly borne the ark. Solomon worshipped before the ark after his dream in which God promised him wisdom. During the construction of Solomon's temple, a special inner room, named Kodesh HaKodashim, Eng, Holy of Holies, was prepared to receive and house the ark, and when the temple was dedicated, the ark, containing the original tablets of the Ten Commandments, was placed therein. When the priests emerged from the holy place after placing the ark there, the temple was filled with a cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. When Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter, he caused her to dwell in a house outside Zion, as Zion was consecrated because of its containing the ark. King Josiah also had the ark returned to the temple, from which it appears to have been removed by one of his predecessors, cf.2 Cron. 33 34 and 2 Kings 21 23. In 587 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. There is no record of what became of the Ark in the books of Kings and Chronicles. An ancient Greek version of the biblical third book of Ezra, 1 Esdras, suggests that Babylonians took away the vessels of the Ark of God, but does not mention taking away the Ark in rabbinic literature. The final disposition of the Ark is disputed. Some rabbis hold that it must have been carried off to Babylon, while others hold that it must have been hidden lest it be carried off into Babylon and never brought back. A late 2nd century rabbinic work known as the Tesefta states the opinions of rabbis that Josiah, the king of Judah, stored away the ark, along with the jar of manna, and a jar containing the holy anointing oil, the rod of Aaron which budded in a chest given to Israel by the Philistines. This was said to have been done in order to prevent their being carried off into Babylon as had already happened to the other vessels. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Shimon, in the same rabbinic work, state that the ark was, in fact, taken into Babylon. Rabbi Yehuda, dissenting, says that the ark was stored away in its own place, meaning, somewhere on the Temple Mount. The ark is first mentioned in the book of Exodus, and then numerous times in Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, I Samuel, 
2 Samuel, I Kings, I Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Psalms, and Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, it is referenced by Jeremiah, who, speaking in the days of Josiah, prophesied a future time, possibly the end of days, when the ark will no longer be talked about or be made again. Rashi comments on this verse that the entire people will be so imbued with the spirit of sanctity that God's presence will rest upon them collectively, as if the congregation itself was the Ark of the Covenant. According to 2 Maccabees, at the beginning of chapter 2, the mountain from the top of which Moses saw God's promised land would be Mount Nebo, located in what is now Jordan. In the New Testament, the Ark is mentioned in the letter to the Hebrews and the revelation to St. John states that the ark contained the golden pot fothed manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Says the prophet saw God's temple in heaven opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. Catholic scholars connect this verse with the woman of the apocalypse in, which immediately follows, and say that the blessed Virgin Mary is identified as ark of the new covenant. Carrying the Savior of mankind within her, she herself became the holy of holies. This is the interpretation given in the 3rd century by Gregory Thaumatur Gus, and in the 4th century by St. Ambrose, St. Ephraim of Syria and St. Augustine. The Catholic Church teaches this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Mary, in whom the Lord himself has just made his dwelling, is the daughter of Zion in person, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the glory of the Lord dwells. She is the dwelling of God. With man. In the Gospel of Luke. The author's accounts of the Annunciation and Visitation are constructed using eight points of literary parallelism to compare Mary to the Ark. St. Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, is credited with writing about the connections between the Ark and the Virgin Mary, O noble Virgin, truly you are greater than any other greatness. For who is your equal in greatness, O dwelling place of God the Word? To whom among all creatures shall I compare you, O Virgin? You are greater than the Malo, Ark of the, Covenant clothed with purity instead of gold. You are the ark in which is found a golden vessel containing the true manna, that is, the flesh in which divinity resides, homily of the papyrus of Turin. Chapter 2, Surah 2, of the Quran, verse 248, is believed to refer to the ark. The Arabic word sakina, variously translated piece of reassurance or spirit of tranquility, is related to the post-biblical Hebrew shakina, meaning dwelling or presence of God. The Islamic scholar al-Baidawi mentioned that the Sakina could be Torah, the books of Moses. According to al-Jalalan, the relics in the Ark were the fragments off the two tablets, rods, robes, shoes, mitres of Moses and the vase of manna. Al-Thalabai, in Qazis al anbiya the stories of the prophets, has given an earlier and later history of the Ark. According to Rubin, the Ark of the Covenant has a religious basis in Islam, and Islam gives it special significance. Since its disappearance from the biblical narrative, there has been a number of claims of having discovered or of having possession of the Ark, and several possible places have been suggested for its location. 2 Maccabees 2 4-10, written around 100 BC, says that the prophet Jeremiah, being warned by God before the Babylonian invasion, took the Ark, the tabernacle, and the altar of incense, and buried them in a cave on Mount Nebo informing those of his followers who wished to find the place that it should remain unknown until the time that God should gather his people again together, and receive them unto mercy. Mount Nebo is also described in the Bible, Deuteronomy 34, as the site from which Moses views the promised land, and apparently also as his final burial place. Mount Nebo is approximately 47 kilometers, 29 miles, slightly south of due east from Jerusalem, near the east bank of the Jordan River. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church claims to possess the Ark of the Covenant, or Tabot, in Aksum. The object is currently kept under guard in a treasury near the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. Replicas of the Aksum Tabot are kept in every Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church, each with its own dedication to a particular saint. The most popular of these include Mary, George, and Michael. The Kebranagest was composed to legitimize the Solomonic dynasty which ruled the Ethiopian Empire following its establishment in 1270. It narrates how the real Ark of the Covenant was brought to Ethiopia by Manaliga with divine assistance, while a forgery was left in the temple in Jerusalem. Although the Kepernagest is the best known account of this belief, it predates the document. Abu al makaram writing in the last quarter of the 12th century, makes one early reference to this belief that they possessed the Ark. The Abyssinians possess also the Ark of the Covenant, he wrote. 
and, after a description of the object, describes how the liturgy is celebrated upon the ark four times a year, on the Feast of the Great Nativity, on the Feast of the Glorious Baptism, on the Feast of the Holy Resurrection, and on the Feast of the Illuminating Cross. In his 1992 book The Sign and the Seal, British writer Graham Hancock suggests, contrary to the Kepernagest, that the Ark spent several years in Egypt before it came to Ethiopia via the Nile River, where it was kept in the islands of Lake Tana for about 400 years and finally taken to Aksum. Archaeologist John Holliday of the University of Toronto called Hancock's theory garbage and hogwash, while Edward Ellenderth, a former professor of Ethiopian studies at the University of London, said he wasted a lot of time reading it. On June 25, 2009, the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church of Ethiopia, Abun Palos, said he would announce to the world the next day the unveiling of the Ark of the Covenant, which he said had been kept safe and secure in a church in Aksum, Ethiopia. The following day, on June 26, 2009, the Patriarch announced they would not unveil the Ark after all, but that instead he could attest to its current status. The Lemba people of South Africa and Zimbabwe have claimed that their ancestors carried the Ark South, calling it the Ngoma Lungandu or Voice of God, eventually hiding it in a deep cave in the Dumb Mountains, their spiritual home. On April 14, 2008, in a UK Channel 4 documentary, Tudor Parvet, taking a literalist approach to the biblical story, described his research into this claim. He says that the object described by the Lemba has attributes similar to the Ark. It was of similar size, was carried on poles by priests, was not allowed to touch the ground, was revered as a voice of their god, and was used as a weapon of great power, sweeping enemies aside. In his book The Lost Ark of the Covenant, 2008, Parfit also suggests that the Ark was taken to Arabia following the events depicted in the second book of Maccabees, and cites Arabic sources which maintain it was brought in distant times to Yemen. One Lemba clan, the Buba, which was supposed to have brought the Ark to Africa, have a genetic signature called the Cohen modal haplotype. This suggests a male Semitic link to the Levant. Lemba tradition maintains that the Ark spent some time in Sina in Yemen. Later, it was taken across the sea to East Africa and may have been taken inland at the time of the Great Zimbabwe civilization. According to their oral traditions, some time after the arrival of the Lemba with the Ark, it self destructed. Using a core from the original, the Lemba priests constructed a new one. This replica was discovered in a cave by a Swedish-German missionary named Harold von Sakar in the 1940s and eventually found its way to the Museum of Human Science in Harare. Parfit had this artifact radiocarbon date to about 1350, which coincided with the sudden end of the Great Zimbabwe Civilization. French author Louis Charpentier claimed that the Ark was taken to the Chartres Cathedral by the Knights Templar. One author has theorized that the Ark was taken from Jerusalem to the village of Renly Chateau in southern France. Karen Rawls has cited Freemason Patrick Byrne, who believes the Ark was moved from Renly Chateau at the outbreak of World War I to the United States. The Ark of the Covenant was said to have been kept in the Basilica of St. John Lateran, surviving the pillages of Rome by Alaric I and Gazeric but lost when the Basilica burned. Rabbi Eliezer Ben Jose stated that he saw in Rome the mercy seat of the temple. There was a blood stain on it. On inquiry he was told that it was a stain from blood which the high priest sprinkled thereon on the Day of Atonement. In 2003, author Graham Phillips hypothetically concluded that the Ark was taken to Mount Sinai in the Valley of Edom by the Maccabees. Phillips claims it remained there until the 1180s, when Ralph de Sudley, the leader of the Templars found the Maccabean treasure at Jebel al Madba, and returned home to his estate at Herduik in Warwickshire, England taking the treasure with him. During the turn of the 20th century British Israelites carried out some excavations of the Hill of Terra in Ireland looking for the Ark of the Covenant, the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland campaigned successfully to have them stopped before they destroyed the hill. In 1922 in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, the royal tomb of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, KV-62, was opened by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. Among the artifacts was a processional ark, listed as Shrine 261, the Anubis Shrine. Almost immediately after publication of the photographs of this sensational archaeological find, some claim that the Anubis Shrine could be the Ark of the Covenant. John M. Lundquist, author of The Temple of Jerusalem, Past, Present, and Future, 2008, discounts this idea. The Anubis Shrine measures long, wide, and high in the shape of a pylon. The biblical Ark of the Covenant is approximately long, wide, and high in the shape of a rectangular chest.
Egypt. Lundquist observes that the Anubis shrine is not strictly analogous to the Ark of the Covenant, it can only be said that it is ark-like, constructed of wood, gessoed and gilded, stored within a sacred tomb, guarding the treasury of the tomb, and not the primary focus of that environment, that it contains compartments within it that store and hold sacred objects, that it has a figure of Anubis on its lid and that it was carried by two staves permanently inserted into rings at its base and borne by eight priests in the funerary procession to Tutankhamun's tomb. Its value is the insight it provides to the ancient culture of Egypt. The Ark of the Covenant is the main plot device in Steven Spielberg's 1981 adventure film Raiders of the Lost Ark, which depicts it as located by Indiana Jones in the Egyptian city of Tanis in 1936. It is mentioned briefly in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, 1989 and appears in a cameo in Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, 2008. In the Danish family film The Lost Treasure of the Knights Templar from 2006, the main part of the treasure found in the end is the Ark of the Covenant. The power of the Ark comes from static electricity stored in separated metal plates like a giant Leiden jar. It appears in the video game Assassin's Creed, 2007, where Robert de Sablé found a piece of the Eden and Altair ibn La'a had planned to stop him, but he couldn't. It's also mentioned in, 2015, and in the film Assassin's Creed, 2016. Yom HaAliyah, Aliyah Day, is an Israeli national holiday celebrated annually on the 10th of the Hebrew month of Nisan to commemorate the Israelites crossing Jordan River into the land of Israel while carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.